Good afternoon, I'm James Schelling, the President and CEO of the National Defense University Foundation. Thank you for joining our virtual national security briefing series. And thank you to Lidos and our board member, Bill Bender in particular, for the support for this series. We appreciate it a great deal. We're bringing all of this to you so that you can learn from experts in the national defense sector. We ask that you answer and ask all your questions in the chat. We will screen those questions. We will ask them of the participants, and we may have some follow-up information afterwards, including answers to questions that we weren't able to get to or reference materials that are discussed during the webinar. And now I'm pleased to turn it over to National Defense University President Admiral Rogi. Thank you for joining us, sir. Okay, and thank you, James, for that uh, kind introduction and, of course, for hosting today's webcast. Uh, the National Defense University Foundation is one of the university's most important partners. Uh, and you'll hear more about that in a moment from uh, Admiral Manazer. Uh, but in reality, every one of you listening today is one of our partners because of our shared interest in the security of our nation. Uh, this is the NDU Foundation's seventh virtual national security briefing since COVID precluded our face-to-face -face gatherings. Uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to James and the Foundation for spearheading this series. Uh, it is through these kinds of dynamic discussions that we gain valuable uh, new perspectives on national and global security issues. And these webcasts also allow us to come together to build an understanding of emerging technologies and points of view that are essential to our education mission. On behalf of NDU, I also want to take a moment and thank the Honorable Bob Work, uh, Govini's Chairman of the Board, and also Govini's CEO, Tara Murphy-Doherty, for joining us to provide insight into how data and decision science are being leveraged to transform defense. Uh, they'll each be introduced more formally in just a few minutes, but I'd, I'd like to take a moment to offer my own personal and professional gratitude to Secretary Work. Uh, he has truly been the tip of the spear and a trailblazer on the future of warfare, defense strategies, technologies, and transformation in the Department of Defense. And as further evidence, uh, Mr. Secretary, of your important contributions, our NDU students are required to study your work on the third offset strategy. Now, today's topic of digitizing the business of defense is critically important because our current threat landscape has evolved dramatically to include these non-traditional means of competition. And it's NDU's mission to prepare today's rising national security professionals to become that next generation of senior leaders across military, government, and, and industry that our nation will depend upon tomorrow. So for anyone new to this forum, just a quick word about your National Defense University. I'm certain that this crowd appreciates that we live in an increasingly complex, dynamic, and uncertain world. We face many competitors and threats to our security, and to counter these threats, America requires leaders who can outthink our adversaries. Because the technological superiority we have long enjoyed is important, but it is insufficient to deliver the warfighting advantage that our nation's security demands and our service members deserve. In fact, competitors are investing heavily trying to erode our technical advantages. So it's imperative that NDU be able to contribute to developing intellectual advantage. Our students are equal parts military members of the U.S. Armed Services, but also civilians from U.S. government departments and agencies. And this year on our campus, 120 international students from 65 friend, partner, and allied nations. And if we do well at our education mission, then these students who come to us as tactical experts in their fields will graduate with the ability to launch the kind of ideas that could preclude the need to launch weapons. And that's a positive effect that reaches far beyond the classroom and beyond graduation day, because the ways in which uh, the U.S. and our partners work together on common security challenges are ways that are increasingly joint and interagency and international. So the relationships that are built in our classrooms translate directly into relationships that serve our common security interests. And so the lasting measure of our success is the peace and security and stability enjoyed by the United States and our partners and allies. In the words of former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, education is quite simply peace building by another name. It is the most effective form of defense spending there is. So let me then suggest that if you would want the leaders of your national security enterprise, the key decision makers contributing to your peace and security, if you would want them ideally to be well-educated in how to do so, then you should not only be partners of NDU, but advocates. 
And I hope that that will encourage you all to learn more about the Chairman's University, your National Defense University. Uh, so it's now my pleasure and privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Rear Admiral Mike Manazer. As a naval aviator, he has a cool call sign, call him Nasty. Nasty is Vice President of Navy Systems at Boeing and serves as Chairman of the Board of the National Defense University Foundation. Uh, he retired from active duty in 2017 uh, after more than 30 years of service. His naval career included 15 overseas deployments from both coasts, over 3,700 flight hours in the F-14 Tomcat and F-18 Hornet, an impressive 1,200 arrested landings on aircraft carriers, and perhaps more harrowing and life-threatening five tours in the Pentagon. He's uniquely qualified to assist the NDU Foundation and, and to lead the organization, having served in the Office of the Secretary of Defense on the Chief of Naval Operations Staff and as the Assistant Chief of Staff for Readiness. He has been responsible for the development, programming, and budget of all U.S. Naval Aviation Warfighting requirements, resourcing, and manpower. Nasty, thanks for being here and introducing today's special guest speakers. Thanks, Admiral Rogi. I appreciate that. You humble me with uh, that. I remember last week you asked me, what have you done for me lately? Uh, it is often said that D.C. is the most harrowing AOR, the most dangerous AOR, and that's why I joined the board of the National Defense University. Uh, as was said by James and by, by uh, Admiral Rogi so eloquently, the foundation exists solely to provide mission critical support to the National Defense University. The National Defense University Foundation forges public-private partnerships and secures resources to propel high-priority and performance-based initiatives not covered in National Defense University budgets or public funding. Why is our mandate so vital to support NDU? Because the NDU Foundation can positively impact the NDU experience and its students in ways the university cannot. And because NDU students will become NDU alumni. That is where the intensive education and preparation they gained at NDU solidifies into who they are as leaders, exactly as Admiral Rogi said. Like their fellow NDU alumni, they will become national security leaders, working relentlessly behind the scenes without fanfare, making critical decisions to protect our national interests in thousands of different companies, agencies, military facilities on every continent. For NDU graduates, failure is simply not an option. We might not hear about conflicts or crises averted with a phone call between trusted allies, NDU alumnus to NDU alumnus. We might not be aware of the NDU graduates who are leading instrumental teams and building national security solutions that our allies try to replicate and our enemies try to steal. But there they are, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day working for all of us. NDU alumni protect our nation, economy, infrastructure, interests, and the very essence of our democracy. What can each of us do to safeguard the future when we have no concrete ability to control the present day? As corporate or individual citizens, we can invest in the NDU Foundation and the national security professionals who will continue to protect our sustained security and stability in whatever forms these steps take and whenever threats occur. Let me be clear, your support enables this partnership between the Foundation and NDU. And that takes us to today's focus. In alignment with the 2018 National Defense Strategy, the NDU Foundation continues to be a conduit for transformation, focused on building a bridge between the National Security Innovation Base, Silicon Valley, the Defense Industrial Complex, as well as the Department of Defense within the National Defense University. During our May 22nd National Security Briefing, Josh Marcus and Vince Cerf discussed data as a national resource. Our national security depends on our ability to make wise and informed investments that leverage data, turning data into knowledge, into wisdom, into decision-making. With us to discuss these two topics are two of our country's leading experts. Tara murphy Doherty is the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of Govini, a decision science company de dedicated to advancing U.S. competitiveness through dynamic data and machine learning. Tara has held senior positions in technology across industry, government, nonprofit sectors, including at Palantir, and serving as Chief of Staff for Global Strategic Affairs in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. With, it, with Tara is the Chairman of the Board of Govini, the Admiral Bob Work. Bob served under five Secretaries of Defense as the 32nd Deputy Secretary of Defense and as the Under Secretary of the Navy from 2009 to 2017. Prior to his government civilian service, Bob served the United States Marine Corps for 27 years. His life has been devoted to defending our nation. 
Bob is widely credited for his work with the Department of Defense Intelligence Community on the third offset strategy, which aimed to restore U.S. conventional overmatch over strategic rivals and adversaries. As you might expect, Bob has received numerous international private sectors and industry honors. What is remarkable is that he is one of only two people in our country to earn the Pentagon's highest award for civilian twice, Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service. He was also awarded a National Intelligence Distinguished Public Service Award and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Distinguished Civilian Service Award. Bob is a leading voice in defense strategy, operations, technology, and programming and budgeting. His legacy of transformation continues at DOD today and will last long into the future. Thank you, Tara and Bob, for joining us. It is a true privilege to have you here today. James, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you and welcome. We'll go ahead and start into your presentation, Tara and Secretary Work. Great. Thank you, Admiral Manazer, Admiral Rogi, James, the entire NDU Foundation team who's been wonderful in setting this up, and of course the NDU community. Secretary Work and I are both thrilled to participate today, and we're really looking forward to the discussion. Next slide, please. I thought I'd get started with the most important aspect of our business, which is our mission statement. Gavini is a decision science company purpose-built for national security. Over the past 10 years, the Department of Defense has actually made tremendous strides in bringing data into decision-making. And, and what Gavini is focused on doing is helping the department usher in the next era of this, of this uh, phenomenon, which is really not just data for decision-making, but data at scale for decision-making. That can only be accomplished with machine learning, advanced data science, but I believe ultimately is going to be key to the adoption of uh, or the success of the United States in the innovation competition that it's facing, particular vi particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. Next slide, please. I'd like to echo uh, Tara's thanks to our host today. It's great to be here. And uh, I can't wait to hear the questions. Look, as I think we all know, we are in a period of great power competition. It would be hard enough, you know, going up against two great powers, uh, both of them nuclear armed. It's really going to require us to up our strategic game. As uh, Secretary Mattis stated in the NDS, the 2018 NDS, he called for urgent change at significant scale. Now at the broadest level, we are in a innovation competition with these two uh, great powers, with China as the most daunting one. This innovation competition is going to play out both in economic security as well as national security, and will have an enormous impact on our lives. Um, so, the innovation competition is one that we have to keep our eyes on the ball uh, within the rubric of a long-term strategic competition with these great powers. The United States hasn't faced any competitor with a GDP, a gross domestic product, greater than 40% of its own since 1886. Uh, in the midst of World War II, the combination of Russia, excuse me, Germany and Japan broke 40% just by a couple of percentage points. And the Soviet Union never broke 40% in the long Cold War. China has already surpassed us in purchasing power parity and will likely pass us in absolute GDP in the late 2020s. It also is the most advanced technological competitor we've ever faced. The Soviet Union couldn't compete with us in niche areas like nuclear weapons and space, but in terms of broad technological capability, microprocessors, information systems, they just could not compete. China is a peer competitor in every sense of the word. So this China is going to be the most challenging strategic competitor we've ever faced, and we are really vying for innovation superiority. Now, in the national security realm, this translates into a competition for military technical superiority. And once again, China here is really pressing us hard. Now, whether or not 
well, however we call it, the third offset strategy envisioned that we are moving towards a new type of warfare, which we refer to as algorithmic warfare. The PRC, the Chinese military, or the PLA, the Chinese military, sees this exactly the same way, and they refer to it as intelligentized warfare. And here is the definition. Combat operations conducted with intelligent weapons, equipments, and platforms using artificial intelligence as the core with technical support from information networks, big data, cloud computing, the Internet of Things, and intelligent control. In this new type of warfare, software, AI, and autonomy will be the ultimate weapons and data is going to drive all of them and make our software, AI, and autonomy better. You know, I, in the Cold War, of course, we'd fly over with our national technical means, the Soviet Union, we would count the number of bombers, we'd count the number of ICBM silos. But now what happens if you fly over China and see a field of old MiG-19 and MiG-21 fighter jets without their cockpits? And it just looks as though it's a boneyard. But another way to look at it is if they have the right autonomy and AI driven by machine learning and good data, then they are transformed into autonomous, maneuverable, and attributable or expendable supersonic drones equipped with swarm coordination and the ability to operate in contested airspace. So algorithmic warfare is going to be rife with surprise on either side. And we can't focus on individual platforms or standalone assets anymore. We have to focus on the cognitive system that runs an autonomous internet of war. So when I was the deputy secretary of defense, infused with this thinking, the thing that most bothered me was the lack of decision quality data at the highest level of the Department of Defense. Because of efficiencies, we would get rid of all the analytical back office of the Department of Defense. We would cut it to the bone. And essentially what we would do is if uh, first Sandy Winnefeld, who was the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and later Paul Selva, both of us would sit in an organization or a, a forum called the Defense Management Action Group. And we would try to decide what should we invest in? How much should we invest in? And a lot of it came down to instinct and intuition. So for the longest time, I will tell you that we were buying cyber by the pound because we did not have the data to tell us what the return of investment of $100 million in cyber capabilities were. So when I got out as the deputy secretary, Sandy Winnefeld, who had joined Govini, called me over and said, hey, you have to see this. So I came over and they showed me a taxonomy of the third offset strategy. And what Govini can do is it can literally track to the penny, uh, to the part on every single contract let by the Department of Defense. And what they did is their data analysis, their machine learning, went, took a look at all my speeches on the third offset and what I was saying, and followed it all the way down to the individual contract decisions so that I could see, hey, here was the intent of what we were talking about in a third offset, and this is how it's translated into a contract. And I was floored. In many cases, it was completely different than what uh, Sandy Winnefeld or Paul Selva and I intended. Having that kind of data would really provide the department with the wherewithal to compete in this innovation competition, the contest for military technical superiority, and the digital arms race that we're in right now in al algorithmic warfare. And so I was really attracted to Govini's kind of approach on data, and I'll turn it over to Tara to talk to you about uh, the way Govini looks at the data challenges facing the department. 
Yes, there are really four pillars to making advances in this area and creating the kind of data environment that will help the department overcome the challenges that we all know fairly well at this point. The department doesn't lack for data. In fact, it has a, a tremendous volume. The challenges lie in managing it and, as Secretary Work mentioned, getting decision grade information out of it and immediate insights and at a pace that keeps up with uh, the speed at which leaders have to make decisions today. So those four pillars are really treat, first treating data as a strategic asset. And, and this was touched on earlier in the, in the introductions as well, and is excellent that it's as a concept getting traction within the national security sphere. And that's because in order to get to decision grade data, particularly at scale, machines have to be involved and have to tackle the problem. Data scientists are there to, to lead the way and guide the machine learning and the application of AI, uh, but it really has to be accomplished through automated processes, not manual efforts of the past. The second is immediate access. And this is all about removing data latency in order to support that rapid decision making that I just referenced. Data is both dynamic and it is ephemeral, but our systems don't always enable that. At times, they actually truncate it or limit what data naturally can do, which is provide a real-time or near real-time picture of operations, whether that is military operations or it's business operations, or it is market operations that may be relevant to the department, but not necessarily taking place within DOD, which ties into the third aspect. DOD can be at times it can have an exquisite picture of what is happening within the department itself or within particular programs, depending on how well it's lever leveraging its data. But that's no longer sufficient. And for both the global enterprise that is DOD, as well as the, the strategic uh, environment and the nature of great power competition, DOD can no longer just have a good handle on its own activities and its prime contractor partners, but it needs to understand a much fuller picture. What external data sources can provide is the connective tissue between departmental activities and everything else in the global marketplace, whether that's institutions or people or technologies. That's how, uh, I, that is the, the key piece that leveraging external data really can add to, to that broader view. And then finally, data sets have to have the power to talk to each other. Um, it, can, it cannot just be about data aggregation or consolidation, which has been the, the accomplishment or the big movement of the past decade. Really, these data sets have to be linked. And then once linked, decision makers and analysts actually have the ability to not just peer very deeply into their own portfolio, but also to peer across data sets and across data silos. I often say that the department operates in a cross-functional way, but its data systems don't. And this is a key area, which you'll see touched on later here through Gavini taxonomies, where we can use machine learning in particular in order to create that cross-cutting view and start to give the department a data picture that aligns with how it really operates in the world. Next slide, please. And back over to you, Bob. Thanks, Tara. We're going to give you a couple case studies, just a couple to give you a sense on how data can really help the department get around these uh, uh, issues. And uh, the first one we want to talk about is the national defense strategy. So uh, could we have the national defense strategy slide, please? OK, well, while we're waiting for the slide to come up uh, again, the National Defense Strategy, I think, was really, really important. And uh, next slide after the case studies, please. Yep. 
Now, the NDS was a major change from what I'll call the post-Cold War period, uh, in which the United States had almost every strategic advantage that you could possibly think of. And we were, of course, focused in counterterrorism, uh, opposed nation building, a regular warfare in the Middle East for a great period, but great part of the post-Cold War era. And now the national defense strategy says we have to turn our attention to a long-term strategic competition with, uh, a with a resurgent Russia and a rising China. And it's coming at a time when everyone expects the total defense budget to start to tip over, flatten or tip over a bit. So we really need to be clear about our prioritization and how we make investments. And there really is no clear visibility through the PPBE process to determine whether it's executing, where we are executing the strategy as called for by the Secretary of Defense. We have these things called strategic portfolio reviews. Let's, let's take a look at space as a portfolio. Take a look at our vulnerabilities. Take a look at our uh, advantages and disadvantages and determine how we make that portfolio stronger with regard to our competitors. But in terms of the overall strategy, there was really nothing that would uh, tell you, okay, this is how you are executing the strategy. Next slide, please. So one of the things that Govini does is it can taxonomize data. Now, these orange boxes, there are seven of them here, and this shows the modernization priorities as a share of the overall DOD investment budget from FY16 to FY, uh, I can't see, uh, there, to FY20. Now, if you go into the NDS, you'll notice that these are not the seven boxes or the seven areas uh, that are in, this, uh, in the strategy. And that's because what the taxonomy does is it looks at the way money is being expended or allocated and it naturally populates it. So for example, it combines joint lethality and contested environments and forward force maneuver and posture resilience into a single segment which the taxonomy referred to as joint lethality and resilience in contested environments. And second, it breaks apart cyber from space and it combines it into a single C5 ISR segment because the data was naturally structured that way through the analysis of the data. So here I am, Sandy Winnefell, Paul uh, Selva and I are sitting in a DMAG and we've made a lot of investment decisions in FY16, FY17, and FY18. This would tell us, okay, this is what's happening. The first thing that would stand out to me is that resilient and agile logistics, which is absolutely critical to our concepts of operations against the PRC in the Western Pacific, investments going down. Now, there may be good reasons for this, but without me knowing that investments are going down, I wouldn't even know to ask the question. The other thing that stands out is ISR goes down very modestly. Again, I probably wouldn't be wor too worried about a 0.3% reduction in ISR, but ISR is gonna be again, critical to operations against both a China and a Russia. And I could ask the question, what is this? The answer might come back is, oh, we're cutting predator orbits uh, because we don't, you know, within the priorities of the uh, national defense strategy, we don't need those. And I'd say, okay, let's roll off to unmanned air platforms. You'll see that it goes down 7.6%. Uh, and you'll see the natural kind of connection between those two. When you taxonomize the data this way, this is the way you're spending money, senior leaders. Is this consistent with what you intended when you publish the national defense strategy and the defense planning guidance. If it's not, you better make some changes. So 
the other thing that comes out when you look at this and extend the analysis out through FY25, the end of the five-year uh, defense program or the future year's defense program, we're only going to bump up another percent. And you're sitting here going, okay, for the last three years, we've done a lot of prototyping. We've started to pursue advanced capabilities, but it doesn't look like we're making a major move in fielding those capabilities. This is, the, this is what I would conclude from this data. And I would say, am I right or am I wrong? Again, this type of taxonomy really provides a senior decision maker with an awful a lot of data to allow them to make cogent decisions. Back over to you, Tara. Great, next slide, please. Another one of the areas where Gavini's decision science is having a big impact, again, it comes down to visibility, is supply chain illumination. And supply chains in the defense space is just, it's a challenge that begs for a data at scale solution. And it's also a challenge that cannot be solved by the department's data alone. So it brings together a number of the different aspects of the decision science platform and approach that we talked about earlier. The challenge with the department's supply chains are exactly as we all understand and would expect. They're massive in volume, they are incredibly complex, and they are truly global. Next slide, please. Part of the reason that supply chain has gotten so much attention this year and continues to be and an is likely a growing uh, area of importance for DOD is actually COVID. This has really underscored the fragility in certain parts of the supply chain. And what we have found through a number of our defense partnerships is that the different services have a fairly good handle on major part commercial partners of theirs, the defense industrial base members whom they know well. They, they have a, a good understanding of how those companies are operating, how they're positioned, and frankly, they, the department had a sense of where the problems were likely to surface in the industrial base. What they didn't know is what they didn't know. And particularly as you travel down the many tiers of the supply chain, they simply didn't have a good way of bringing all of that data together and automatically surfacing places where there is potential risk. I'll do a little bit more tee up while we're waiting for the slide to advance. The other aspect that this is all very connected to and uh, is very relevant um, in this to uh, this this issue area right now is the reshoring effort that has been announced by Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, Ellen Lord. So what Gavini looked at recently in particular was not just supply chain risks writ large, but especially the presence of foreign owned businesses in the defense supply chain. So our methodology enables us to map supply chain relationships. We start with the prime contractors that the department is working with today. And then we extend that to all of the tiers, going down to raw materials and original suppliers. What Gavini's data set provides is granular detail about the businesses that are linked in those relationships, as well as the products and services uh, that travel through that supply chain, eventually serving DOD. So through a series of machine learning techniques, we can automatically analyze determine and then proactively surface to our users areas of risks of risk and many of these users are program managers they're acquisition officials who are looking into uh, new procurements they're analysts who are trying to understand vulnerabilities or potential vulnerabilities but ultimately the impact is that these kinds of insights are enhancing overall integrity of DOD supply chain and hopefully informing or better informing mitig mitigation strategies, again, at scale in a way that's comprehensive and more comprehensive than has been accomplished in the past, as well as rapidly. Looking at the numbers on this slide, what you can see is actually a bit staggering. And notably, foreign companies actually make up roughly 70% of tiers two through five. So the picture is quite good in that 
first tier, which is what you would expect, the jump in starting with the second tier in terms of the presence of foreign owned businesses is not what you would expect. And from the folks that we've talked to is not what most of the department has expected. Mm -hmm. To connect these dots with what I talked about conceptually earlier, I would just call out that our ability to pivot on the data uh, depending on different aspects and look at things like a technology lens or a, a particular business, um, not just through a program lens, gives us the ability to also call out certain industries, which you see in the chart on the right. Uh, in areas like uh, telecommunications and specialty chemicals, you can see just how prevalent Chinese companies in particular are in defense supply chains. Overall, one of the reasons that we wanted to highlight this example is because it's, it really demonstrates how data at scale can provide targeted insights for decision makers who are grappling with questions such as, where do I even start? or how do I determine my priorities and where to, to direct initial resources as they seek to address change, challenges like this and also undertake really important efforts like reshoring. That was all the material that we had provided or pulled together in our presentation and uh, Secretary Work and I are very happy to answer any questions, James, if that's a good next step for your audience. Thank you very much. It's a great next step for our audience, and I appreciate your patience with the technical difficulty that we were having with slides not changing when we were pushing the buttons. Uh, so apologies for that. We uh, will make the slides available on the website afterwards so that you'll be able to take a look at them and reference them if you weren't able to see them for some reason. And I uh, really appreciate all of your patience with, with that as an audience, and especially for the presenters. I know that that's disruptive when you're not getting exactly what you're expecting when you're expecting it, so thank you. So this is really fascinating to me, and I think that probably the most important question is this. This data exists, you're able to organize it. How are you able to supply it to government, and how are they able to use it effectively today? I saw one of your, um, one of your information points on your website lists a lot of the folks who you're working at with, and can you explain a little bit how you're working with DOD and the various actors who you're working with now, and how people who are in NDU right now learning can eventually use these tools? Yes, absolutely. So today we work with a number of different offices across the Office of the Secretary of Defense. We're working with the Joint Staff, with all of the services and, and several cross-functional teams that have been established, as well as a few of the defense agencies. So we're very lucky to be touching every part of the national security enterprise. And primarily, folks get to us in a few different ways, which aligns really nicely with the different stakeholders and needs that exist within DOD. So uh, the most common use is logging into our analytic platform. It is game changing, I think, for analysts in DOD because on day one, immediately they have access to data. And from my own experience in the Pentagon, as well as the everyone I talk to, sometimes the closer you are to making a decision, the less direct access to data you actually have. And whether it's through a complicated data call process or simply a long chain of passing information along, it, it really slows down your ability to make data-driven decisions. Uh, so our platform is designed to immediately reverse that. And then one of the fantastic things that's happening in DOD today is we're seeing lots more data scientists brought on board. And so a number of those folks who have technical skills where they want to be working with a number of different large data sets, most commonly a combination of Gavini data and internal government data, they can access our data directly via API and then do their own data science and build on everything that we're offering from a high fidelity curated data set perspective. And if I could uh, jump in on this, I think the department really is starting to understand how important uh, data and data science is to the operations of the department. Now, one of the first things is that the CMO, the chief management officer, really started to look at how do you use data to become more efficient in the defense-wide account, what many people refer to as the fourth estate. 
and how do you become more efficient and how do you approach this? In fact, I think everybody probably knows that Secretary Esper told the CMO, look, I want you to treat the fourth estate like a service. And so you will submit a POM uh, on the fourth estate. The only way that will happen is with good data science. Uh, you know, you have so many different field activities and combat support agencies. They all have different budgets. Uh, if you don't have a way to surveil the entire uh, defense-wide account, you simply will not be able to understand what you have to do uh, to start to approach this. So there was an IDIQ contract let by the CMO, which uh, Govini was awarded, uh, and so there's one aspects, James, where it's really focused on the business aspects of the department. Then there is one focus kind of on the audit. Uh, there's a large database called Advana, uh, which is often referred to as the universe of transactions. And it is handled by the uh, Undersecretary of Defense for the Comptroller. And it is trying to understand the literally the entire universe of transactions in the department so that we understand how many flows, is it flowing in accordance with the priorities established by leaders, um, and how can we do that more efficiently. We're going to have to have a separate data set for operational missions like Project Maven, uh, you know, data for full motion video. Uh, which everyone will be able to use. So I'm quite encouraged that the department sees the importance and, and they just brought on a new chief data officer, Dave Spurk, came up from the uh, Special Operations Command. Uh, and the stuff that the Special Operations Command is uh, doing with data is unbelievable. I would say that Special Operations Command is the exemplar for a COCOM uh, getting into this business. So. Uh, this is a wave that's coming, and as you said, James, I think it's important for everyone at NDU to really understand this wave and to try to figure out how they can catch the wave and ride on it without wiping out. So I think it's very interesting that you're talking about two different types of data and usage of data. One is in the operational level and how we can react instantly to those sorts of things. And one is in the procurement and purchasing and the addition of capability and capacity here and looking at the supply chain. And eventually they all merge and they become very important together. But I think for our purposes in, the, in these questions, there, there are a couple of different uh, questions that people have asked. And, and I wonder if you can answer them in regard to both of those, because I think that we haven't yet captured how to effectively differentiate those pieces when we're looking at AI and the use of data and decision making and, and the time period of, of doing so. Um, so I'm going to read you a couple of questions here as we go forward in the next few minutes. So how do we train leaders to prepare for decision making in the age of AI when decision grade data presents immediate access and recommendations but can't explain the pattern recognition and scope of data? Well, I'll try first, Tara. Uh, this is a key thing. We are going to have to retrain the force for algorithmic warfare. Uh, in the end, if all we have is our commanders who do what the AI recommends, then get rid of the commanders and just go all automated. Uh, really what you have to have are commanders that take input from the data as presented and take input on the courses of action that are suggested by AI and use their judgment and their intuition and their combat experience, as well as recommendations from subordinate commanders and the intelligence uh, officers and the planning officers and make decisions. This is going to be a different type of decision making. There was a project in DARPA in the early 2000s called Deep Green. And what it showed is a commander would sketch the commander's ideas about courses of action. That would be ingested into an algorithm. And the algorithm would actually take the courses of action, build them out, and present back to the commander the courses of action that appear uh, to provide the greatest opportunity for success. 
the command, it would come back to the commander and then the commander would do what was called sketch to plan. And the commander would sketch out the plan based on recommendations on the course of action. And once again, it would be ingested into a uh, algorithmic engine at the time called Blitzkrieg. And Blitzkrieg would actually run them in a combat analysis type uh, scenario and come out with, hey, this looks like the plan that would be most advantageous. That would in then be injected into another algorithmic engine uh, in which real-time data from the battle space and intelligence would come in and it would pop out a plan. I mean, it would actually pop out a plan which would then the commander would approve and be it would be promulgated. It's that human machine collaboration backstopped by decision quality data that is going to make the difference in warfare in the future. And if we can't get that right, and we can't train our commanders to live in this type of a world, then quite frankly, we'll lose the competition. I hear all the time, hey, we have all this combat experience and the PRC, for example, hasn't had a war since uh, 1979 against uh, Vietnam. So we have this enormous advantage. An algorithmic warfare where you have human machine collaboration on decisions, a lot of that combat experience uh, will not be as advantageous as it might have used to be. The algorithms really, really, really are important. And there are many people who say the side with the better algorithms is the side that is going to win. The other piece of that, James, is the department needs to figure out an entirely new framework for working with the commercial sector. And that idea is not new. And it, I think it's actually evolved more than once over the past seven, eight years. Initially, it was that DOD wasn't accessing non-traditional defense contractors or the best companies that are out there in the American technology sector. They've largely addressed that. You look at the tech accelerators, you look at DIU. So the next challenge that we hit was Silicon Valley didn't want to work with DOD. And we've seen significant change there in two directions. One, you see companies that are not just willing to work with the department, but are proud to be a part of the national security mission. And then you see a tremendous explosion of technology development across other cities so that Silicon Valley is no longer the center of the universe. And you simply don't get that disinterest in supporting the mission uh, that you did for a period of time in the Valley in places like Austin and Boston and, and others. So then it became a question of, well, do we have the right acquisition methods and authorities to get access to these companies that we've now identified and are willing to work with us? And frankly, the ex authorities existed the entire time. And there's been a bow wave in terms of utilizing some of the non-FAR methods that can enable that access. OTAs are a great exam example, and there's been an explosion um, in their usage in order to accomplish that. But what I find is that it all comes colliding down to what hasn't changed yet and I think will be key in order to delivering against what Secretary Work is describing, which is the department is still thinking about outsourcing the wrong things. And it's never really going to get the best out of the American tech sector until it learns to be comfortable with things like licensing data and not building your own software and being willing to think differently about what should be insourced and what can be outsourced through these phenomenal new partnerships. Oh, I got a two finger, James. Um, you know, I think probably everyone at NDU has heard of the Chinese policy of civil military fusion, where there really is no difference. You know, anything that is uh, being worked on in a Chinese commercial company is immediately available to the uh, PLA and vice versa. Um, I talked with uh, Andrew Ng, who used to be CEO of Baidu, and he, at a conference, he came up to me when we were talking about this. He says, look, you don't understand. If a company in China working on AI comes up against a technical problem that it can't solve, it literally calls the government, says, I need help, and a SWAT team comes their way. Vice versa, in the military, if they come up against an AI application that they want to pursue, but they haven't been able to crack the algorithm, they'll call companies and a SWAT team will come their way. 
Now, I'm, Tara and I wouldn't suggest that we need to try to mirror civil military fusion. But one of the things that NDU could think about is we clearly need an improved public-private consortium, which takes US government, commercial sector, FFRDCs, UARCs, and it figures out how do we work together to make algorithmic warfare a reality in a way that provides us with competitive military advantage. So one of the things we could easily do, I think, is have a public-private center of excellence for testing, evaluation, validation, and verification of algorithms and uh, algorithm protection. People are trying to come in and corrupt our data. Well, the commercial sector has that same problem and they want to solve it too. So if the NDU could think about models uh, that would allow us to set this up, I think it would really do a, go a long way towards getting the Department of Defense along the path it needs to go. Well, I'll certainly be putting a call into both of you to discuss that because we've been discussing exactly how we might be able to teach some of these issues with students here. And I, I think there's a great deal of interest in understanding how to tap into that expertise. Some of the other questions that we've received have to do with whether or not um, we can innovate and change the speed and agility when what we're really been focused on is risk reduction. And additionally, the question sort of assumes something that you answered differently, um, is that senior leaders aren't familiar with and aren't using OTAs and non-FAR methods. However, as we've seen, that is happening in some places, but maybe not uniformly across the force. Any thoughts on that? One of the most common themes we see when we dive into the data, and that alone is not intuitive, the fact that the department has all of these non-FAR based authorities, and it's a good thing that they have them and an even better thing that they're taking advantage of them, but there is a kink in the plan, which is people lack visibility into what happens when they're being used. And so we get asked questions a lot around, where is department? where are department resources going that are directed toward grants? Are directed toward SBIRs or STTRs or OTAs, they tend to be a bit of a black box. So we can crack open, we can shine some light in that box and show where the money's going. Unfortunately, the analysis is showing and the data proves out that including for OTAs and a number of these other uh, non-FAR based methods, a lot of the awards are still being directed to major primes. So it's very possible if you pull the thread on the supply chain that the primes are working with smaller companies or are buying up innovative firms across America, um, but they are by and large winning the preponderance of OTAs and other innovative acquisition authorities. And James, this is a little, the question it touches on a pet peeve of mine. Uh, so let me get up on my soapbox for just a second. You know, if you take a look at the Department of Defense and you compare it against all the great companies in America, including the big tech powerhouses, the Department of Defense's historical uh, trail of innovation is really hard to match. You think of an officer who joined the Air Force in 1955. Over the period of a 40-year career when they become a four-star, you had the transition from jets, I mean, from props to jets. You had the development of intercontinental bombers, then intercontinental ballistic missiles, then space capabilities, then stealth capabilities, then precision guided munitions, then all sorts of IT. And you can stack that up against any company and say, wow, this is a 70 year record of continual innovation the best in the world in terms of national defense. Now, every so often we get them, uh, you know, just fed up with our acquisition system and we make changes. And so the 2008 WASARM, Weapon Systems Acquisition Reform Act, it was designed to do one thing, stop Nun McCurdy breaches, stop overruns and stop schedule slips. That's what the WASARA was all about. It required program managers to have 70% confidence in their schedules and 70% confidence levels in their budgets. It demanded deliberate, conservative decision-making. 
And if you take a look at the record of the Wasara, it worked. By 2013, 2014, the number of Nun McCurdy's had dropped off the map. The size and the absolute scale of both overruns and schedule slips had really, really dropped. But what you got was a very conservative approach to acquisition. So then Congress ripped it up and said, okay, uh, now what we're worried about is we want you to go faster. We want you to fail fast, learn fast, blah, blah, blah. And they gave us all sorts of new capabilities. And what's happened is the program managers just need to adjust. They were extraordinarily conservative in going this way. The whole idea of failing fast and learning fast sounds great on paper, unless you're a program manager being held to account on your program. So I think what's happening is that's all changing. People are getting more used to these OTAs. Uh, but now Congress is saying, you're not using them quite the way we wanted them to. You know, you started using them for major acquisition programs. We wanted you to use them for mid-tier things and the components of the major acquisition programs. So James, we're in this kind of cultural shift where the entire acquisition workforce is adjusting to this new kind of call for innovation. We have, as Tara said, new authorities. We didn't use them the way Congress intended at first, but I think all that is starting to shake out. So my, I'm sorry to get on my soapbox, but the Department of Defense is not as uh, uninnovative as many people would lead you to believe. And if we go after data, we will really be innovative because we'll actually know uh, what we're talking about. And we'll actually make decisions that are based on hard data. Sorry, I had to do that. No, that's fine. I, I actually appreciate that answer a great deal. And I think that that leads to my last follow-up question here which um, I'm going to ask, and then I'm going to also ask you to all elaborate on anything else you think our students should know broadly after that, because we have about uh, four minutes left. And the question is, is really focused on what is it that we need to be able to do for our students to learn to use this data in this way? And I'm going to use a specific example. The example that you used of the supply chain being 70% foreign vendors in the, the uh, tier two, two through five. Is this an opportunity for us in our defense sector to identify where there are gaps that um, business and onshoring could look at filling? And what is it that we need to do to build our national security innovation base and our, our defense uh, sector? I would say one of the first things that we can be teaching your NDU students, but each other and people who are uh, developing competencies in using data and data at scale is don't be afraid to ask the question. One of the things that I hear all the time in conversations in the Pentagon is, well, what I would really like to know is X, but I know we can't. So let's figure out how to design a study or design an effort to tackle it. And I say, back up. Yes, you can and we're going to show you how and it's because processing power and machine learning techniques and data science have fundamentally changed what a single person armed with the right machines can can do the second thing is a a basic level of technical aptitude and curiosity in the space will go a long long way there are, in addition to Gavini's decision science platform, there are lots of capabilities out there that are phenomenal in terms of making data and complex uh, data usage uh, accessible for people who don't have deep technical skills. If there's such a barrier that a user is hesitant to even log into a system and poke around or uh, develop some skills in that, it's really hard to overcome. But a little bit of curiosity and interest um, can go a long way and doesn't have to go so far as learning Python or R or the next language. So those are two places to start. I can't really add much more to that, James. You know, uh, the thing that NDU can really help is we are moving to an era of whether you call it intelligentized warfare or algorithmic warfare it's happening. We're on the road. It's inevitable. 
And I don't think the Department of Defense has really grasped what that means in terms of the way we train the force, the way we exercise the force, uh, our doctrine, our concepts of operation. And it really has got to, it really requires kind of people who have the experience of students who come to NDU to think about this in a deliberate way and say, what is our strategy for data? How should it be? I mean, what, you know, is it just internal data or is it a combination of internal and external data, which I think Tara and I would say, yeah, it, it is a combination of external and uh, internal data. You know, how do we train the force? Uh, how do we make better public-private partnerships so that we can exploit the tremendous capability in our tech sector? So just having classes like this, I, you know, I've never heard of a class like this at NDU. I applaud you for setting it up. You know, that sounds self-serving, but you know, we are we're zealots about data and decision science. And the way we say it is, we're in this innovation competition, and we want to outwit our import our our competitors. We don't want to outthink them. We want to outwit them, and we want to create an advantage, a competitive advantage for the United States military. So uh, thank you to the students for all of the questions, and uh, you know I hope that NDU can help us on this way. Tara and Secretary Work, thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and we'll be sure to follow up with you on anything else that you think we should be sharing with our students. I read several of the white papers on your website and some that you shared. I think that they're very, very interesting, and I think that there's a lot to learn from them. Thank you again very much. Thank you so much, James. Thanks, James. And thanks to Admiral Rogi and Nasty. I had to get Nasty in there at least one time. Thank you, sir. He, he appreciates it, sir. <laughs> Take Thank care. You.